Welcome back everyone. The breakout sessions covered a real range of topics and I hope you enjoyed them. We'll now move on to the important topic of achieving sustainability impact through investment. And don't forget that you can ask questions on screen, just include both your name and your organisation. To introduce the session, please welcome the CEO of the PRI, Fiona Reynolds. Well, thanks, Susanna, and welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining today's panel on Investing for Sustainability Impact. I'm delighted that you've taken time out of your busy schedules to join us. Given everything that's happening at the moment across the world with the growing second wave of COVID-19, I really hope that wherever you are, that you and your families and your colleagues are all safe and well. Also, given the world that we find ourselves in at the moment, I really couldn't think of a more relevant time to discuss this topic, as I strongly believe that creating a shift in the investment industry towards assessing and accounting for sustainability impact has never really been so important. Over the past decade, but particularly over the last few years, we've witnessed that the uptake of ESG investing has begun to accelerate as responsible investment philosophies and practices have both moved towards the mainstream and really begun to mature. While there is clearly still much more to be done, today for the first time as an industry, we're beginning to be able to widen our focus and thinking on sustainability. Undoubtedly, this trend was already underway. However, the COVID-19 crisis has accelerated its progress in a substantial way. I really think that the world's woken up and is finally beginning to understand the importance of sustainability, the interconnectedness of issues, and perhaps one very small silver lining that we might see in all of this tragedy is the significant boost it's given sustainability and the opportunity that it does give us to leverage the crisis to build back better. For us to advance responsible investment though and to take it to the next level, we need a shift in both thinking and in practices. We need to be, move beyond the narrower lens of asking what do ESG risks mean for my portfolio to a more expansive way of thinking that includes asking what risks does, the, does my portfolio have on the real world, the world into which my beneficiaries live and plan to retire. It's the subject of a forthcoming report from Freshfields that's been commissioned by PRI, UNEPFI and the Generation Foundation that will contribute, contribute rigorous legal analysis to emerging practice. We, of course, have worked with Freshfields over many years on the issue of fiduciary duty and looking at the legal frameworks that investors work within. These frameworks, of course, evolve over time, as does the law. In 2005, Fresh, the Freshfields' first report concluded that investors may integrate ESG factors into their investment decision making. And this was really groundbreaking work at the time. And it was work that underpinned the formation of the PRI itself the year later in 2006. In 2016, together with UNEPFI and Generation Foundation, we embarked on fiduciary duty in the 21st century, which said that to meet your fiduciary duty, you must consider material ESG risks. Investors now have a new challenge, how investment activity can take account of and, where necessary, prioritise sustainability impact. In our view, the, re the law really does need to keep up. If we think back just five years ago, we didn't have the Paris Agreement, we didn't have the SDGs, but today investors are expected to play their role in fulfilling these global commitments, commitments that governments have made. But does the law as it currently stands allow it? Are there legal impediments to investors adopting impact targets? For example, that an investor's in investors' investment activity is consistent with no more than 1.5 degrees of warming? Or on what positive legal grounds could or should investors integrate the realisation of the SDGs in their investment decision making? That's the focus of the object of investment that we're going to discuss in today's panel. 
So with our panel, we're going to look at this topic from a number of perspectives. We're going to think about it from a legal perspective, from a policy perspective, a perspective and importantly, from an investment perspective. So just before I introduce the panel, we have a poll running related to this session, which you can see right now and vote on by visiting the PRI's Twitter account, which is at PRI underscore news. And the question is asking you about barriers to integrating real world impact into mainstream investments. Um, a reminder also to everyone watching, you're invited to submit questions through the Q&A function throughout the session, and I'm going to try and draw on them as we discuss this with the panel. And don't forget to engage with us on social media using the hashtag PRI Digital Forum. So now to the discussion, and I'm joined by our panel of experts, Martin Spock, who's the head of the Sustainable Finance Unit in the European Commission's Director General for Finance but financial services. Julianne Hilf, who's the partner at Freshfield, and she's the lead lawyer on our forthcoming report. And Martin Jonathan, who's the general counsel and a member of the executive management team at AP2 in Sweden. So first to you, Julianne, for the legal perspective, what does investing for sustainability impact really mean when we're talking about this issue in our upcoming report? Yeah, thank you, Fiona. And first of all, thank you for having me on, on, on this panel. And it is a real pleasure for us to work with you on, on, on this exciting um, report, which hopefully kind of will be as groundbreaking as the 2005 report. Um, so what what is investing for sustainability? impact, what does it actually mean? It seems to be a very easy question to answer, um, but it is actually not. And kind of the longer we think about it, the more complicated it actually gets, if you so want. So, I mean, we as lawyers would first kind of turn to the law and uh, and see whether we find any definition in the law. And there's no legally defined term in any of the jurisdictions we've looked at that would actually kind of define um, investing for sustainability impact. Thus, kind of, we decided that in the context of our research, we are more using it more as a conceptual net, broadly covering any investment approach by which the investor aims at generating a positive or reduce a negative sustainability outcome. So the key feature in our view is purpose and outcome. So we're focusing on outcomes rather than the decision-making process, which was kind of our focus back in 2005. Um, Thus, for the purpose of our research, we're looking at whether the law requires, allows for, or prevents to pursue such sustainability goals, maybe even giving them priority over achieving financial return, and doing that by using the levers that investors have, like capital allocation, stewardship, and, and policy work, eventually. So one question we were asking ourselves is kind of what is the difference to impact investing, a term that is also kind of widely used in the investor space. And we think that kind of impact investing seems to be defined thus far at least by reference to certain types of investors and certain kind of sort of enterprises or asset classes that are invested in. So targets are often like early stage enterprises that have a specific goals like in the renewables industry. Um, our concept or the concept of sustaining for uh, of investing for sustainability impact as we use it in our, our report is a lot broader and covers all types of investors and all types of, of activities. So I hope it does, did clarify a bit kind of what the definition is supposed to look like. Well, it, it, it is complicated and we are talking about going to a new level. We're not just thinking about uh, thinking about ESG risks on your portfolio. We are trying to move the debate along, as I said, to thinking about the risks of your portfolio in the real world. So can you just share a little bit more about the forthcoming report and the legal analysis that we're, that we're undertaking? Yeah, sure, I can. I mean, before I come to that question, maybe just one more sentence on your previous question, the comment you, you just made. And indeed, this is kind of the very important point that we, or the, the issue that we think is really the most important one is kind of that, 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 that we are on a journey kind of from, um, incorporating ESG criteria in the decision-making process, which is kind of something that is relatively normal, if you so want, today, to really looking at the impact, so the outcome of investment 
decisions, which are very hard to measure. And that's an issue we might come to uh, later on. But kind of this is kind of what, what really the focus is now. Um, our report is, well, work in progress, if I may say that at the very beginning. Um, and thus, um, as my very long response to your very easy question just now showed, it's very complex. <laughs> so it has taken us kind of longer than we anticipated. And it, it kind of, we, we really try to come up with something that is uh, hopefully helping the industry to get a clearer picture on what investing for sustainability impact actually is. We do cover various types of institu institutional investors, so pension schemes, insurers, and mutual funds, as well as the investment managers who act for them. And we're looking at 11 jurisdictions, which kind of acts com uh, uh, adds complexity to, to the picture as well. And these 11 jurisdictions, they cover basically all geographies. So it's the US, Canada, Brazil, and the Netherlands, EU, UK, EU, if you might call it a jurisdiction. Sorry for, 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 for that, Martin. Uh, France, Japan, China, Australia, and South Africa. Um, so the idea of the report really is kind of to provide clarity to the industry what, as of today, is allowed or kind of a duty under existing law and kind of we might find that there are some surprises where kind of indeed already today there are possibilities or even maybe obligations to invest for sustainability impact um, and the idea is that kind of this assessment of the status quo would then kind of allow you as the PRI and policymakers. And, and, and policymakers of this world kind of to build on this legal evidence, if you so want, to come up with kind of future policy uh, uh, work um, that is needed to further um, enable investors to invest for sustainability impact. So it, it really is about kind of taking stock, um, interpreting the existing law in a way that might kind of help investors to invest for sustainability impact, but also really to lay the ground for future future policy work. And thus kind of, we, we do identify some barriers um, to investing for sustainability impact, which kind of would then hopefully help policymakers uh, uh, of this world kind of to address this uh, more clearly. Um, I, I mean, in the interest of time, maybe just one more minute on kind of our key findings so far, as said, kind of it's very preliminary at this point. Um, quite surprisingly, kind of if you think about it, there are kind of duties to invest for sustainability impact in the law today already, because sustainability is not just about the environment. That's kind of the first thing we always think about. It's also about kind of social issues and COVID uh, unfortunately kind of illustrated that quite quite clearly. So for example, if you take sanctions, sanctions, the law on sanctions prevents investors to do something and kind of requires them to do other things. And the whole idea about the law of sanction is actually to achieve something that is a that is not a financial interest, but kind of in the interest of all of us. Um, we've also seen, so it's not a concept that is absolutely um, un, un, uh, unprecedented in the law. Um, we also see that kind of systemic risks such as climate change, if we turn to the environment, for example, they often impact future beneficiaries, obviously much more than kind of the beneficiaries of, of, of today. Um, so there are two elements to that. One is kind of that we see increased reference to adopting long-term perspectives, um, which might even boil down to a an obligation um, to invest for sustainability impact already today, or at least that there's a certain flexibility. And the other point is that because such risks are what, what systemic or kind of cannot be tackled individually, there might as well be a not just the flexibility to collaborate by ways of stewardship, for example, and policy work, but maybe this might even boil down to, to a certain duty um, to, to, uh, to collaborate. Um, well, and the last point is, sorry. A, hang on, um, that's a perfect segue there, I think, because I want to get into the policy perspective sure. um, and and the things that you have talked about to then uh, come to Martin Falk to talk about that, um, that policy perspective. So, Martin, you've heard about the report and you've heard about the legal perspective, so let's come to you. Um, the Commission's most recent consultation on the renewed sustainable finance strategy, including questions on impact. Could you say more about the Commission's thinking in this area? 
Thank you very much, Fiona, and good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be um, here with you today. I think that the topic is very, very uh, timely for our deliberations, indeed in the context of the preparation of the renewed sustainable finance strategy. We are now entering a new phase where we are concluding the um, implementation of the existing action plan on sustainable finance, which was already quite ambitious at that time back in 2018, but now it's very clear that uh, this ambition that we envisaged in 2018 is no longer fit for purpose in the current circumstances. There are two major changes that have really changed the landscape in which we are operating. The first one is the European Green Deal that has clearly increased the uh, ambitious uh, uh, goals that we already had before, but now the targets are increasing further, the climate neutrality by 2050, uh, the increased targets for 2030. And the second context, Fiona, you mentioned yourself, the recovery context reminds us that we really need to work much harder on, on sustainable finance uh, going forward. Um, the, um, the approach that we have taken so far uh, when it comes to regulation and sustainable finance has been in the area of transparency and we have not imposed any requirement on anybody uh, you know to invest only in those assets that would be let's say taxonomy compliant or divest from other assets the requirements that we have imposed so far were really transparency requirements not behavioral requirements let us be clear about that and we believe that this was a necessary step now, in the context of this increased ambition, we need to reflect harder how to translate these this new targets, I mean, like climate neutrality 2050, uh, climate objectives for 2030, and other environmental objectives, what it means practically on the ground uh, for the financial sector and corporates. So yes, it is very important, and don't get me wrong, it is very important to continue working very hard on, on the tools and frameworks that would allow companies and financial sector to manage the risks, continue working very hard on the fiduciary duties and the traditional concept of fiduciary duties, I mean, of the 21st century. But I think that we really do need to, um, you know, rethink the whole fundamental uh, approach of, of the sustainable finance at this point. That's why, yes, I mean, if you're, to your question now, we included uh, specific questions in our consultation asking stakeholders what they believe needs to be done, needs to be changed now in the current context. And I have to say that we received quite encouraging feedback. Uh, there were some stakeholders who argued, look, stick to the disclosures. Uh, that's fine enough. Uh, we will do our job. But there were stakeholders who also argued, look, I mean, you, you do not need to reflect on some more ambitious actions, either regulatory or non-regulatory, in by which, and even incentives uh, by, by the policy making that would incentivize uh, financial market participants and corporates to demonstrate that not only that they are doing something positive for sustainability, uh, you know, here and there, but to measure and quantify and determine much more clearly how significant the impact of their activities and operations um, uh, is. Uh, we have really uh, kind of moved the, the think it's important to do something for environment or for climate into determine what is actually enough, what is sufficient, what is the, the minimum degree of, of impact that can be qualified as, you know, making a positive uh, positive contribution. As you know, I mean, uh, and BRI obviously has been extremely helpful. I mean, we have been working so far on taxonomy. Uh, before the end of the year, we are going to enshrine um, uh, climate taxonomy in EU law. That will, by the way, will be a, one of the key tools that will uh, determine what substantial contribution, what, what this substantial contribution to meeting environmental objective is. So everybody can basically compare the performance of their assets and investments and activities against these benchmarks. But we need to go further. We need to really reflect, um, you know, beyond uh, on what we will do beyond environmental issues, beyond environmental objectives. You mentioned Fiona Social. There we have not really done much. Uh, we also have some other objectives, increasing resilience and all that. So, um, uh, maybe, I mean, going now back to the kind of concrete things, uh, we very much welcome the, 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 the work that uh, Fresh Wheels and uh, we are going to discuss today. It will be very, very important contribution and, and, uh, and major input to our deliberations. But we should not stick only to identifying the barriers, I mean, in our regulatory frameworks. Our thinking in Europe, in the European Union, is going further. We do want to also explore not only what the obstacles are, but how we can, you know, encourage uh, in, um, sustainability impact investing 
with a more proactive, um, uh, you know, approach and a notion. And there are things that the policymakers can do and create the right environment uh, for doing that. And we will certainly use also the regulatory interventions for that. Uh, but at the end, I mean, it's also a lot in the hands of the of the financial sector. And here we do need to continue working very, very closely with the sector. Uh, I also would like to mention that uh, we are preparing another kind of key, uh, one of another key measure that we are preparing for adoption, which is uh, a requirement for investment advisors to ask their uh, clients whether they have any preference for environmental, social, or governance aspects. And once this obligation is in place, there, um, if there is uh, preference expressed along those lines, there will be an obligation for uh, the investment advisors and obviously asset managers and investors to follow up on that obligation, on that preference. So um, there might be, and we hope that uh, many retail investors will say, I do want to invest in, um, in, uh, in uh, products and uh, in other projects that will make a considerable impact. And if this preference is expressed, there will be an obligation throughout the chain, through the fiduciary duty that we have currently on the table uh, to act accordingly. We do obviously need to discuss and reflect whether this is sufficient, whether this channel would work uh, appropriately and would, whether it would work uh, correctly. Uh, but um, we believe that so far we are not yet there. We are not yet there again in the current context that I mentioned. I think that I will stop Fiona here. Um, you know, I think that uh, you mentioned within the consultation that you know you got a lot of different views, and I have to say that you know PRI is a global organisation. We have over three thousand signatories. We have signatories who think about responsible investment in different ways, and we've got signatories who are in different stages of their journey of, of what they're doing. And so we always think about those things in the context of what we're doing, of the work that we're doing. But I do think, like as with Julia. Um, that like the report in 2005, like the work that we did in 2016, this will be a groundbreaking report and it will help us take us in a new um, direction. So I want to move, though, to the investor perspective. Of course, the our signatories are the investors. So, um, Martin, there are really a plethora of terms in responsible investment today that try to frame what investing for sustainability impact means. Sometimes it's quite confusing to people. Can you tell us what that means to you at AP2? And what do you see, why do you see it to, as important to include impact considerations in your investment process? Thank you, Fiona. Yeah, let me try. Uh, <laughs> there are many different terms. I think that though it's important to start and, and recognise that all investments have impact, right? Um, so, um, um, regardless of which term you use, that, that, that is a fact that you have to, to take on board and, and any discussion on, on the subject really needs to, to start with that. The role of pension funds, um, I think you said before, is to provide financial stability over the long term for, for, for its beneficiaries. Um, the AP funds, they do this for the Swedish pension system. Um, now, you mentioned the uh, Fresh Fields report uh, from 2005 and, and the evolution since then. Um, uh, and it's now commonplace to integrate ESG factors, I think. Already, though, when the AP funds were set up in, in the year 2000, uh, we were tasked with taking into account environmental and ethical issues. And, and the legislative intent at that time um, already was to focus on impact on people and the planet uh, and not risk to our um, uh, assets. So at the same time, we were not to sacrifice our return targets. So that was still the priority. Ever since then, we've undertaken a very large number of activities um, uh, to integrate ESG issues into our investments and, and, and to some extent also to take account for impact. Uh, just to mention a few uh, early examples, we appointed an external manager already in 2004 with focus on sustainability. We calculated um, our CO2 footprint the first time already in 2008. Um, we, at the, in the same year, we invested in the first uh, issuance ever of a green bond. Um, so that was quite early on. Um, but ever since then, our approach has become more and more sophisticated. 
And it's become increasingly, increasingly clear, I should say, to us that we and similar institutions must um, more systematically integrate sustainability impact into our operations to be successful. Um, this is because consideration of impact goes well beyond financial measurements. Um, the capital allocated to pension funds is not without strings attached. Um, it comes together with accountability. Now, in simple terms, we uh, will not be allowed to make the investments we believe are necessary for the pension system unless people trust us to do the right thing. Uh, and you know, uh, I think that a growing number of financial institutions have recognised this, and that's one reason attention uh, or more attention is now placed on real-world impact. It's becoming uh, and quickly becoming an integral part of our licence to operate, you could say. Um, so accounting for impact is the right thing to do. Um, and we will not resolve the climate crisis or achieve the sustainable development goals, for that matter, unless these become strategic objectives for financial institutions, um, such as AP2. So, um, Martin, you were, I, I talked about the fact that the PRI is a very... Uh, you know, big tent organi organisation and we've got signatories from all around the world or at different stages of what they're doing. And you're obviously mm -hmm. very advanced in your thinking about these issues and, the, and embedding these in what you're doing. So can you just talk a little bit more about how you ensure that sustainability impact of invest investment decisions are embedded in the pension fund strategy? And can you give us a couple of examples I can try, um, <laughs> because as you say, it's not that easy. And, and if you are like AP2 and many others, an investor in all asset classes, um, including on the public markets, it is really difficult to identify impact uh, and perhaps even more so additionality. Um, so initially, um, going back to the early years, um, we took a pragmatic uh, approach to the difficulties and we focused on some key areas, developed them over time. Uh, relatively early on, we decided to build knowledge and competence internally, um, even though that may take um, a longer time than to get started properly. It does create a stable foundation for your work going forward. Um, but then for it to become, I mean, sustainability impact investing, uh, to become truly embedded in your strategy, you must take a structured approach. Um, and over time, we've put in place a framework for that. Um, I mentioned the act that initially governed the AP funds uh, uh, activities, and this act was very recently amended to clearly stipulate that we should act as uh, exemplary, I think the English term is, asset managers and asset owners. So we have continued to build on that mission. We have uh, done a number of things. We have clarified our investment beliefs uh, with respect to sustainability and perhaps in particular the climate. Uh, we've developed principles for sustainability and developed a new sustainability strategy covering all asset classes and activities. Um, now, you could do all that and, and still not make any impact. Um, it could become like any other desktop product. But um, from a management perspective, it is crucial to foster a culture in your organization that facilitates creativity and, and commitment, I think, to achieve the objectives. Um, and, and also, we have always strived to make certain that the methods we apply in investing and the strategies we try to implement are based on sound academic, academic research. Um, an important aspect of this is something Martin uh, mentioned earlier as well, transparency. Um, we report on uh, human rights, we report in accordance with TCFD and, and more generally on our sustainability efforts. Uh, this is important um, both to contribute to um, uh, perhaps a momentum in the industry uh, to do our bit, um, but also to motivate your own organisation to do more. Okay, fantastic. I'm now going to go to, there's lots and lots of audience questions and we've got about 10 minutes, 10 minutes left. So I'm going to go to the questions and try to get some quick rapid fire answers in what is a very complicated uh, topic. So I apologise that I'm asking for that. So um, this question here, um, 
This is for you, Julianne. So it says, in terms of the legal analysis, are there differences emerging between legal frameworks across the jurisdictions that you're analysing and the types of investors that you're covering in the report? Well, quick and easy answer is yes. <laughs> so, full stop. I'll get you to so. elaborate a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, yes, there are differences. I mean, there, there are differences indeed between jurisdictions. So, some jurisdictions are more advanced, if you so want, than others. And the EU, for example, Martin, being on this panel, is, is a particularly kind of uh, um, advanced and the thinking there at the moment and kind of the upcoming uh, legislation proposals that you are discussing at the moment um, are very interesting, I, I think. So kind of this seems to be really, oh, it, could, it could then be um, something like, well, the new standards, so to say, for the world, if you so want. The Scandinavian countries are, are always uh, kind of well ahead of the curve. Um, so there are differences between jurisdictions, yes. Um, there are also differences between um, the various um, uh, investors as well. And there, I guess, the more kind of long-term the investment is, by its very nature, kind of looking at pension funds, for example, the more likely it is that there's more flexibility or even an obligation to invest for sustainability impact. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we're seeing around the world at, at the moment is that, you know, there's a, to me, there's a big, quite a big transatlantic divide. Europe is forging ahead very quickly on the agenda, whereas the US, there's a lot happening there that's trying to really slow down or, if not, eliminate the ability to think about ESG issues. So, um, thinking about policymakers then, uh, there's a question here for you, Martin. Should policymakers be setting communal impact targets or should this be the role of individual investors? Well, Fiona, I cannot say what we will do with our upcoming strategy, uh, but uh, what I think is very important to clarify that the role of the policymakers, which I mean is in the case in this case European Commission, is to provide clarity where we are heading. And I think that this is what we have done very clearly. I mean, the European Green Deal is a priority number one. We have said very clearly, let's achieve climate neutrality. We even adopt a legislative proposal on uh, putting this in EU law. The climate neutrality. So we have uh, made very clear where we are heading. Our job is also to uh, provide the right tools and the right frameworks and and uh, develop the right environment, uh, regulatory environment as well for financial market participants. We don't believe at this point in time um, to prescribe, you know, uh, everything for the financial sector that you have to do this, you have to do that at this point in time, because we believe that, you know, this way, I mean, if we overdo it, I mean, we would, um, we might face the risk of killing innovation. We might, you know, face the risk of over-prescribing what, what the financial sector should do. I think that that would be a bit unfortunate. So we have to strike the right balance here. Um, one thing that I mentioned earlier, I mean, is how we can connect the, these big targets, climate neutrality and the increased targets for 2030 with the action on the ground. And that's not trivial. I mean, we, we say that, I mean, in all our public speeches, and we are, of course, you know, going to deliver on that, but we need to then make it clear what it means in practice. And uh, we do want to have clarity that in five years' time, you know, the situation will be better. And then the financial sector is not only facing uh, lower risks than they are facing now, or at least they, they have better tools and frameworks to manage them, but certainly that they also contribute much more than they contribute today uh, to support businesses on their transition path ways. So one possibility that we were testing in our consultation is whether there is a merit in um, asking financial market participants to disclose what it is that they are going to do not only next year, but how they are going to transition from where they are now to be in line with those objectives over the medium to long term. So this is the kind of long term perspective that I think you, Fiona and Juliana mentioned. So being a little bit more, you know, forward looking than the current frameworks are. I mean, uh, the current frameworks are usually uh, calibrated, you know, for one or two or three years. And that's a bit unfortunate. So, if, I, I mean, I think that here it's really not uh, uh, about overdoing it and over prescribing it. At the same time, we will need more clarity to understand what the financial sector intends to do so that we can actually 
avoid or even prevent any kind of more brutal uh, regulatory requirements that you have to invest X, per, uh, X percent of your assets in this. So that's, that's I think, a, a, a short answer. Okay, so um, Martin, AP2, Martin, I'm going to come to you. I think this is a good question for you. It says, is there a responsibility for investors to use stewardship to drive sustainability impact through their portfolios? Can you say more about the levers investors can use in the current law in investing for sustainability impact, stewardship and allocation is the, is the example? Well, so on stewardship, um, absolutely. Um, I think that, and depending on, on what well, maybe for all investors, I mean, we we are a global investors and, and, and we invest uh, bonds and equities with quantitative strategies. So um, that means that we will be holding a large number of, of uh, companies in our portfolio, a couple of thousand or more. Um, but but it also means that our portfolio managers do not have a direct dialogue with the companies we invest in. So, but engagement and stewardship and, and to identify companies and to engage with and to have a dialogue with is, a, is an incredibly important tool to, to create impact um, in all areas. And, and perhaps we haven't mentioned so much today um, human rights. Um, and I think that uh, when it comes to our uh, obligations to, to work with uh, the UN guiding principles on, UN, uh, on human rights, I think that is a, a very good example where stewardship is, an, is the most important tool, perhaps, uh, to, to uh, make an impact in the real world. Um, um, th that was one of the examples. You also mentioned strategic asset allocation, you said? Um, so yes, um, there's another area where you can can think about how to incorporate impact considerations. It, it gets more complicated, uh, and, and you can do it, I suppose, uh, with the traditional type of of investments uh, into impact that Juliana mentioned earlier on. That you can seek out investments where you will have a more direct impact to finance. Um, companies, uh, evolving companies that, that, that focus on, on new energy solutions, perhaps, or something like that, and that way contribute to, 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 uh, to impact, positive impact. But, but it's also about, uh, again, which, which has been done by, by pension funds for some time now, to screen out those companies that cause a negative impact. Um, and that you can also do in your strategic asset allocation uh, process. Okay, um, lots more questions, but let me get to this one. Uh, so, Martin Spolk, this one for you. The EU taxonomy is helpful in defining what is green. Are there plans for an impact taxonomy to define what qualifies? Uh, Fiona, yes. Uh, we are now um, working together with the group of experts, the, the new platform on sustainable finance, where Nathan Fabian from the PRI is the chair. Uh, we are working on a concept that could possibly extend the, the taxonomy that we currently know as sustainable and uh, substantially contributing to in environmental objectives, to expand it also to the categories um, that would not be necessarily substantially contributing and sustainable, but yet very important for the whole agenda. So here we talk about negative uh, activities or activities that are providing negative impact and activities that are having low impact. The reason why I say it is that we, we would like to, of course, achieve, first of all, the transition towards sustainable investment. That's our priority, I mean, to the dark green space. But we do want to also ensure that there is a transition from the significantly harmful uh, activities to less significantly harmful activities, to neutral or even light green. And this would currently not qualify under the existing taxonomy, but this concept, if extended, would be a very powerful tool to allow also investors who are not yet there to be dark green to make a tangible impact and yet facilitate the transition and make a substantial contribution from uh, basically in terms of reducing harm. Okay, fantastic. Um, Yes, very quickly. And I just add, because what, what, sorry, what Martin just said and, and, and the question to me uh, earlier as well, I think Martin, the work
work you've done with uh, on the EU benchmark regulation and, and the Paris Align benchmarks, that is a good example where you can can work with your strategic asset allocation or your portfolios and align them and actually contribute to to both uh, positive impact and reduce your negative impacts. Right, that's that's a good example of a, of a good regulation, I think. Indeed, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, okay. fantastic, and we look we look to see, we look forward to seeing um, so much more as that work to, um, develops with the commission and the PRI is obviously going to be heavily involved in it. Um, I also just wanted to say because Martin, you were talking about the importance of human rights and. PRI's got a major project that we've just, we're, we're releasing tomorrow on human rights. It's a five-year piece of work where we really hope to transform the way that all investors are considering human rights. So the sessions on tomorrow, I'd encourage everyone to make sure that you uh, tune into that as well. So unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, let me thank our speakers for their time and really valuable insights. So um, we've talked about the project and we've talked about its aims. Our goal is to use the recommendations of the, of the report um, to investors to help inv advance this impact and outcomes agenda so that within the next decade that investors are in a position to achieve sustainability objectives. The report will be released in the new year and as was said earlier, we're focusing on 11 jurisdictions. So the EU, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Japan, South Africa, the Netherlands, the UK and the US. We're going to be running a number of online events on this project in the new year. So until then, if you've got questions, please get in contact with Will Martindale or Olivia Mooney at the PRI. And uh, in the meantime, Again, thank you to our wonderful panel. I hope that everyone out there stays safe and well. Thank you, everyone, and back to you in the studio, Susanna.